considered in this in the dental disease activity. If they're going to have to transition through a significant hard tissue uh, series of augmentation procedures, perhaps they're not the best candidate for that if they have other diseases that are uncontrolled. Tooth variables, the periodontal status, the endodontic, endodontic status, restorative status, mobility, crown to root ratio, perio defect anatomy, the bone quality and the tissue quality must all be considered. The third dimension, today as very nicely shown in our previous lecture, uh, the power of cone beam technology and understanding defects before we ever touch a patient is uh, extremely valuable. Avoiding intraoperative surprises through cone beam diagnostics is key. To take a defect like this that on a periapical x-ray looks like internal root resorption and seeing it three-dimensionally and seeing the extent of bone and hard and soft tissue loss will encounter this lightly. The surgical variable be considered the surgical skill and training and instrumentation we're using in the access to materials that are available to us today. And perhaps the thing that I've been most influenced upon in my short career is the macroaesthetic elements that my partner has taught me and taught so many um, that we, we must consider the things beyond the lips, that we don't have an aesthetic outcome if we consider lip line. Uh, gingival aesthetics and full smile, how this blends with the rest of their face. These are things that must be considered. How the teeth are arranged, how they're shaped, how the tissue is positioned around the teeth. As mentioned already, the biotype and papillary morphology becomes key to aesthetic success. In a case like this where we have originally presented with two failing teeth I'm not saying that we'd make this decision every time, but the decision in a case like this was done to save one tooth, although it has a guarded comprom uh, or a compromised prognosis, in order to obtain a favorable aesthetic outcome on the single tooth implant. And we'll look at this case in detail in just a while. But there are sometimes sacrifices that must be uh, considered to optimize the aesthetic outcome. And, and that's okay, as long as the patient and the referring doctor understand that there is a compromise here and we may have to confront this later down the road. As I mentioned already, the elements to achieve optimal aesthetic outcomes is something we need to talk long and hard through diagnostic wax up and proper laboratory support. There are other issues that have been uh, shown us in the literature that we need to consider as well, and that is that with multiple or single teeth that papillary form can oftentimes be better maintained with ponics uh, versus dental implants. We know from the literature that approximately we can expect about 4.5 millimeters of soft tissue above the bone between a tooth and implant or between a ponic and an implant. It's been set, found uh, via Salama that in a pontic site we're able to achieve up to 6.5 millimeters of tissue depth. So the idea of use, uh, utilizing ovate ponics, be it between implants or between natural teeth, can provide us excellent soft tissue uh, to optimize aesthetic outcomes. Periodontal biotype has been um, discussed thoroughly today, but I don't want to leave it out in my discussion where we know very well that the, the thick and flat is going to be more predictable than the thin and highly scalloped. And that's what both Kois and Salama have, have taught us over the years in regards to um, some type of an expected outcome when it comes to periodontal biotype. Tooth form, the shape of the teeth, or our ability to modify the shape of the teeth, has a strong influence upon papillary form. The thrust of this talk today is about defect classification, how to classify them properly, and then how to implement treatment predictably with them. These are the four that I was able to find. Um, the classic by Siebert and then repeated by Dr. Allen uh, are very straightforward, buccolingual, uh, chronoapical and combination defects. Dr. Sklar in his textbook talks about more of the composition of the defects, whether they're hard tissue, soft tissue, or com combined, and then how to address those based on an implant site preparation, not necessarily 
preservation of soft tissues for fixed partial dentures. Instutor does a nice job of severity and prognosis, which I have some tables for you to, to help uh, uh, clear these things up. Basically, Seabird and Allen are the same, just a slightly different um, numerical versus alphabetical nomenclature to them, but it's the horizontal uh, defect being normal in the class one, uh, in the class two vertical uh, being normal, and then the combination where we're having both a, a horizontal and a vertical component. In classifying severity between less than th three millimeters being mild, moderate, three to six, and greater than six severe. What Studer did very nicely was give us some idea of prognosis, but it's, it, it is really quite straightforward that the defects classification, individual class one, two, three, the worse the defect, the worse the prognosis. Same with horizontal. The worse the horizontal defect, the worse the prognosis of our treatment. The expanse of the defect, whether it's single teeth all the way up to multiple teeth defect, it's going to make us it's going to make it more of a challenge to completely augment the pre-existing defect. And same goes with the vertical component. Um, the more we all know that one of the hardest things we do is, is grow tissue vertically. Just as a means of, of showing a few defects, the class one is the buccal lingual loss of tissue with normal ridge height in the apical coronal direction. Two examples of relatively good papillary height between the defect but a significant buckle, buckle ridge loss. This would probably fit into the three millimeter soft tissue realm because of, uh, so it would fit into the moderate defect. This being a alveolar ridge defect with adequate bone but inadequate soft tissues and via implant combined with soft tissue augmentation we're able to improve the profile next to the dental implant supported restoration. The class two defect, apical coronal loss of tissue with normal ridge width in a buccal lingual dimension. Here is a, uh, a case with a failed dental implant presenting with a patient that will absolutely not go back through dental implant therapy. So we need to determine the way to reconstruct a horizontal defect to create more even tooth lengths. The class three defect combination of buccal lingual and apical coronal tissue loss that results in a loss of normal height and with combined horizontal and vertical bone loss. These are the types of cases that we really need to think long and hard about whether they could be treated at all, especially a patient like this that presents with a failed hard and soft tissue, two separate procedures, already been through a hard and soft tissue attempt. Hard tissue is particulate, soft tissue is with a cellular dermal matrix. Um, and she presents not just with her husband, but with an attorney. So is this the type of patient that we are going to want to jump into complicated therapy to reconstruct a defect? Perhaps maybe this patient is best served with porcelain of a pink and uh, white nature. Another defect, um, what we've got going for us here is the, mes the, the attachment on the natural teeth, uh, the defect was created by an impacted cuspid that um, was ankylosed and caused resorption on the lateral incisor. In a defect like this from a motor vehicle accident, uh, post-trauma, a block graft was attempted. Um, and this is another case that presents as to whether we can really truly meet the patient's expectations. And in this case, it wasn't the patient's expectations that we weren't able to really meet. It was the mother's. So this patient went on her way without any treatment at all, uh, and to my knowledge, is still wearing a, a fairly aesthetic, removable partial denture. And a defect like this poses its problems to treatment most, most definitely. Well, obviously, the most effective way of preventing soft and hard tissue loss is preventing it in the first place by at the time of extraction performing, performing ridge preservation. So before I actually get to ridge reconstruction or defect reconstruction, we'll just quickly review the importance of tissue preservation. There have been many articles talking about flap design to maintain soft tissues. And certainly we want to take these into considerations both with our traditional periodontal therapy as well as with dental extraction therapies and dental implant replacement therapies. 
talking about preservation. Uh, we'll certainly ask our referral colleagues to let us know if this is something that they would like us to do. Would, would they like us to extract the tooth and, pre tooth and preserve the ridge? Would they like us to re deliver the restor provisional restoration? Will it be fixed or removable? And using a referral slip such as this, it helps communication and it is have to have the proper discussion about not just expectations of treatment, but expectations of cost. Who's going to be paying or who's going to be compensated for which procedure? Ridge preservation is something that we all should feel extremely comfortable with. It's highly predictable. Uh, it's something that we can, even with a very relatively inexpensive removable partial denture, preserve hard and soft tissues. We know that the presence of that partial denture in the extraction site will help us by maintaining uh, gingival embrasure form responsible for the ultimate height of the papilla, especially when we're talking about natural teeth because we should be able to maintain a healthy attachment level on the natural teeth. We won't have anything influencing the resorption of bone interproximally if dental implants are not in the treatment plan. We must not only support papilla, we must support the facial gingival margin appropriately with a depth of at least two and a half millimeters. Through a fixed restoration with an ovaponic design or with a removable partial denture, these are critical at the time of extraction to be modified appropriately to support the soft tissues um, the best that we can. Going through not only the fact that placing something into this defect, our previous lecturer mentioned the Nevin study that if we are through cross-sectional analysis revealed significant bone preservation by grafting the extraction site. And I truly believe that if we are going to be removing a tooth in the aesthetic zone, something should go into that socket. I'll certainly not argue that that extraction site may heal on its own without any graft, but if we're talking about soft tissue preservation as a means of optimizing an aesthetic outcome, I would like to put something into that defect. In our office, usually it's something like freeze-dried bone covered with a quickly resorbing collagen membrane. And the most important piece of this puzzle is the removable partial denture that oftentimes come to our office like this and we simply modify with flowable composite to support the soft tissues appropriately. And with this we can end up with maintained facial and interproximal soft tissues, avoiding things such as this by not placing the graft. This is an example from Dr. Nevin's article. So within a few months we have favorable healing and we've got a site that really we're pretty happy with in regards to a bridge, resin bonded bridge or a dental implant. For demonstration purposes, we've merely drawn on our ponic showing the, the apical extent of that portion of the ponic, supporting the facial gingiv gingiva, creating a nice sharp gingival margin profile that is aesthetically pleasing and has proper contours from profile as well as the direct buckle. More challenging defects may need more flap reflection, but they certainly should be preserved in a, uh, in a similar manner, if not with using extra uh, modalities as we did in this case. We used a allograft for our sockets, a membrane, and then some alloderm over the surface of that to reconstruct the buckle plate and end with a ridge that we're happy with two months later. And whether it's, again, whether it's going to be dental implants or uh, a fixed partial denture, we're preserving tissue to optimize the aesthetic outcome. Before we get to the defect design, ovate ponic, uh, preparation is, is essential. Uh, we're able to accentuate the shape of the papilla, create the illusion of a free gingival margin, and it can be simply done with multiple tools. Historically, we may have used an electric surgical device to create an ovate ponic uh, and support that facial gingival margin and papillary tissues. Using our restorative uh, education and abilities by adding flowable composite to ponics, to get the appropriate depth within the soft tissues, delivering in the provisional restoration and leading to an optimal aesthetic outcome in the fixed partial denture. We can use our rotary instruments, certainly for ovate ponic site preparation. Today, we'll even consider going beyond a rotary or electrosurge and use a dental laser for ovate ponic site preparation. 
This is an example of uh, my partners just showing the longevity of an ovate ponic. Many people will ask restorative colleagues, what is the health, the long-term health of an ovate ponic? This bridge was uh, done by a, a very uh, wonderful restorative dentist in Houston and was never placed with permanent cement for documentation purposes. Patient was seen frequently. And we can see as taking this off at five and a half years, mainly to treat this recession defect right here, 